Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, depending on where you are located. Welcome to this uh, Phil Fisher webinar on the use of AI in the workplace from permitted to prohibited practices. My name is Olivier Proust. I'm a partner in the tech and data department in our Brussels office, and I'm delighted to be joined today by Katharina Weimer, who is partner in the tech and data team in our Munich office. Hello, everyone. So this is part of our AI webinar series that we have been running uh, since the beginning of, of this year. Uh, this is the third installment. And as you can see, we are running uh, three other, uh, three new webinars, including this one. So there will also be another webinar on the 24th of October on the rights of the data subjects under the AI Act. And are they any different from the GDPR? And we will have another webinar also on the 21st of November on AI regulatory enforcement. Is it the same as GDPR or worse? And so hopefully you can join us for those uh, webinars as well. Regarding the previous webinars, if you have missed any of uh, the ones we have run in, in our part one, uh, you can find them all uh, on our YouTube channel. We have recorded all of our webinars there and also the webinars that were part of the second series. So without further ado, what are we going to talk about today? Well, um, as uh, mentioned at the beginning, the focus of today's webinar is the use of AI uh, technology or AI practices in the workplace. So we will start and have a look first at some of the prohibited practices. And there are a few things in the HR context that cannot be done. Then we will focus on high-risk AI systems and look at the intricacies of deploying uh, AI and, and the impact it can have on employees. We'll also talk about generative AI, given that everyone now is super excited about Gen AI and seems to be using it more and more. And of course, we'll have a look at the risks and enforcement in this context, and what are some of the steps and actions that companies can take. And with that, I will pass it to Katarina. Thank you, Olivier. Um, thank you for all being here today and listening in on our uh, webinar. First of all, to bring this gentle reminder to you, we wanted to give you the timeline of the AI Act so that you can reflect on what needs to be done by what time. And that also gives you an opportunity to check back on your own progress and where you might fall within the different categories and by when you should be doing that. Um, first of all, as you know, the AI Act came into force in August of 2024. So very recently it entered into effect and um, the first milestone will already be reached in February of 2025. Um, that's the provisions on prohibited practices as well as AI literacy obligations and the general provisions on scope and definitions. That means that you should already be checking whether you um, have already implemented any prohibited practices that you will have to refrain from using in the future so that you can indeed stop that in February 2025. The next important milestone is indeed already in one year's time in August of 2025. That relates to the general purpose AI models. The provisions here will come into play. Also, the penalties will come into play. And that, of course, goes hand in hand with the national appointment of competent regulators. Now, if you've calculated correctly and you understand the intricacies, that means you have about half year of the AI Act in force without having any competent regulator. So if you want to make any severe mistakes, it probably pays out to be an early adopter and finish doing that by August 2025 when the regulators are appointed and may actually take action then. You will then have another half year, uh, another full year until August 2026. 
for the obligations on the high-risk AI systems listed in Annex 3 to come into force and another year for the next AI systems of the higher risk quality, which are listed in Annex 1. So this is a quite a staggered approach, um, which should help everyone to comply and first of all, to classify their own AI systems that they intend to use, and then also to comply with the various requirements. In the meantime, as you may already know, there is an AI pact which is already in force, which enables companies to pledge that they are already in compliance with the AI Act. This was created so as to um, help companies comply sooner if they want to, which already may alleviate some of the burden. Can we go to the next slide, please, Olivier? Prohibited AI practices, that's what we're going to talk about first, because these are the ones that you're going to have to stop using in February 2025 at the very latest. First of all, and now please remember we're talking about AI in the workplace today, so however you want to use it within the company. First is the subliminal techniques. These are set out in Article 5, so generally the prohibited practices are set out in Article 5 of the AI Act, and the subliminal techniques um, are in, um, in number, I think, 5, and we're looking at sublim subliminal techniques that um, distort people's behavior by impairing the ability for informed decision and free choice. And of course, it is also required to cause significant harm or possible to cause significant harm here. Um, the risk of the important adverse impacts on physical, psychological health or financial interests also need to be present. Examples, typical examples of this are um, machine brain interfaces or, or virtual reality. The subliminal components are often used in audio or image um, files. There are video stimuli that persons may not be able to perceive straight away because they escape human perception. Um, one example is also here in the image that we have on screen. You may not see it directly, but there is an, a subliminal image in this can and with ice on it and water on it. Uh, and maybe you can read it, or maybe it comes to mind when you just look at this can. Many people just tell me, oh, I desperately want a beer right now when they see this image. Um, and that's one of the typical subliminal techniques. They're beyond human perception. Um, other categories here are manipulative or deceptive techniques that subvert or impair a person's autonomy, meaning their free decision-making, um, their choices, in a way that they are not consciously aware of. This is very important to um, notice that this is, will be um, prohibited in the future. Next uh, slide, please, Olivier. Exploitation of vulnerabilities. Now, leaving aside that employees are often as such, a vulnerable group. There are vulnerable groups spelled out by the AI Act. Exploitation of the vulnerability of a person or group of persons due to age, disability, social or economic situations, um, ethnic and religious minorities, all these people are considered to be of a certain vulnerability. And again, the the AI is going to be prohibited where the objective or the effect is to once again distort or manipulate the behavior of these vulnerable groups where this causes or is likely to cause significant harm. An intention to cause such harm is not needed as long as the harm results from the manipulation. Now, we've got an example for you in the background, and that is, a, a, for instance, a predatory financial service chatbot, where you have an AI-powered chatbot, chatbot, which is deployed by an, a financial services company to offer loans and credit products. 
And this AI system uses advanced algorithms to analyze financial data, credit card activities, consumer habits, and other data to really identify and target individuals who might be financially vulnerable. So here we are talking about already targeting individuals who are identified by the AI as someone who might be living in financial distress. And now we're exploiting said vulnerability because the chatbot is programmed to use manipulative language and pressure tactics to convince these vulnerable individuals to take out, for instance, a high interest loan or credit product. It might use language which suggests a particular urgency and might suggest that the financial situation could even deteriorate if the individual doesn't take out the additional credit. And that is an example to show how an AI system might leverage the individual's economic situation. And, and exploit the financial distress of the individual. Next slide, please. Emotion recognition systems in the workplace will also be prohibited. An emotion recognition system is an AI system for the purpose of identifying or inferring emotions or intentions on the basis of their biometric data. Now, to be more specific, what Article 5 prohibits is AI systems that are used to infer emotions of individuals in the workplace. It doesn't have to necessarily be if based on the biometric data, but that adds to it. If you use an emotion recognition system, that adds to it. But in general, um, AI systems that infer emotions of individuals are already prohibited. If it is not prohibited, it might directly be considered high risk AI. That is, for instance, the case if it is uh, used in marketing or targeted ads, so not in an, uh, in an HR perspective. As an example of how a company might be using such an emotion recognition system is an AI system that captures facial expressions, voice tones, and physiological signals. If, for example, in a disciplinary meeting or in an annual review conversation in the HR place, where you're using cameras and microphones, because often these now take place via um, remote communication. So we have possibly eyes tracking, facial muscle movements, voice stress analysis, and similar factors. And the AI system will then be able to infer the emotional state of the employee in this case, probably nervousness, possibly some anger or frustration, confusion, anything like that. And then HR might be able to use this analysis to assess the employee's credibility, sincerity, but also the way that person is comfortable and, and might actually make a decision based on this. And because the employee is again in this case very vulnerable and cannot object basically to, to such an analysis, such systems are prohibited straight away. Thank you. Next slide, please, Olivier. Social scoring is another, um, another aspect that is going to be prohibited. Social scoring is basically the evaluation or classification of individuals by public or private actors based on their social behavior with a social score, and that can lead to some sort of detrimental or unfavorable treatment. The reason this is prohibited is because such analysis and evaluation based on social interaction has an impact on the human dignity and values of equality and justice. And of course, it also is a great risk of discrimination if you make, uh, for instance, promotions dependent on inter social interactions between people. Um, there are, for instance, AI systems that could evaluate employees based on their interaction with colleagues 
as an example on, on Teams in the, in the chat platform, but also participation in Teams activities, social gatherings, if these were for whatever reason captured on, on video. Their presence on LinkedIn and social interaction on LinkedIn could also be analyzed. Don't want to give you any naughty ideas here because it's going to be prohibited anyway, but these are just the the possible scenarios that we were thinking of when we were looking at this. The AI system can then assign a social score to the employees to evaluate the engagement in the company and tie that to promotion or non-promotion to other benefits and advancement in the company. This kind of sums up the prohibited practices. And with the next slide, Olivier is going to indulge you in the high-risk AI systems. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Katarina, for this uh, very good overview of, of the prohibited uh, AI practices. Now, looking at the high-risk, this is the, the other um, big category under the, the AI Act and where there's going to be um, you know, the, the bulk of the work for a lot of providers and deployers of AI systems. Now, let's look at what the AI Act says specifically about high-risk AI systems in an HR context. And first of all, it, it does mention um, recruitment. And I have to say that the, the AI Act is quite both detailed and rather prescriptive. Detailed because it uses some um, precise terms. So it says that the AI, if it is used for the recruitment or selection of natural persons will be considered as high risk. Also, uh, other actions are mentioned, such as placing targeted job advertisements or analyzing and filtering those job applications. So in other words, we can summarize this as AI being used as a screening process. Uh, AI, which is uh, in obviously based on algorithms, uh, that can help you to scan resumes and cover letters, identify, for example, some keywords and patterns that match a specific job description um, for a position, an open position within your organization. And you can take it even a step further. You can th think of AI that is going to be used to rank those candidates based on whether they match those criteria and those filters that you have set out, whether they meet the required qualifications that you are looking uh, for in, in the recruitment process. So um, in other words, AI that is used to evaluate candidates, and this can also be used during an, an interview uh, assessment process, this will automatically be considered um, as high risk. The other important uh, section that is mentioned in the AI Act is AI that is used in the context of employee management. And here again, I have to say the AI Act is again, both quite detailed and specific and prescriptive. So if you are using AI to make decisions that are going to affect one way or another, the terms or the conditions of uh, the, the work relationship for employees, for example, um, if the decision is to promote an employee or on the contrary to terminate an employee's work contract or any other work related uh, situation or condition that, that is going to affect the employee, then such use of AI is going to be uh, considered as a high risk. But then it's also interesting to look at some of the other specific examples that the AI uh, gives, for example, allocation of tasks based on an individual's behavior or personal traits or characteristics. Now, why is this interesting? Because it is rather specific, meaning that if you are relying on an AI tool to determine, for example, uh, who within uh, your team is going to manage a particular project or who you are going to give a specific task or project to, depending on uh, individual behaviors or interactions or uh, you know other factors uh, that concern the individuals or the employees personality or or specific characteristics and, and traits um, that kind of use of ai will also be considered as high risk and then last but not least and and i think this is one where 
we should expect the regulators to be particularly attentive once they come in into um, in, in, once they are appointed and, and start enforcing, is the use of AI uh, to monitor and evaluate the performance and the behavior of uh, employees in such relationships. So here again, if AI is used for employee performance reviews or appraisals um, in, in a manner that is going to analyze, for example, work patterns, their uh, productivity metrics, or provide feedback to uh, the superior officers and possibly make recommendations on the basis of such analysis, recommendations uh, to take certain decisions such as promoting an employee or making a salary adjustment or in the worst case scenario terminating an employee's uh, work contract. All In all these situations this is likely to be considered as high risk and so you are going to have to be particularly uh, attentive and comply with the, the provisions on high-risk AI uh, systems in the AI Act. Now, I talked about what was quite obvious. The, there are also some uh, areas that are a little bit less obvious. This one is interesting, education and vocational training. Now, normally, typically, when you think about education and vocational training, you think schools and uh, universities were not necessarily thinking about employees. And indeed, the AI Act says that if AI is used to determine access or admission or to assign natural persons to educational and vocational training institutions at all levels, then it is high risk. But, and this is where I think it's interesting, the wording is a little bit broad because it also mentions AI used to evaluate learning outcomes. And it's not impossible that uh, we, we could imagine that well, companies are indeed evaluating uh, their employees on an ongoing basis, including in the context of professional training, continuous ongoing professional training throughout an employee's career. Um, and so there is an open question whether this provision uh, under the AI Act was intended to apply exclusively to schools and, and, and uh, universities education in the tr traditional sense, or can we extend and, and apply it a little bit more broadly to also to the professional training? So we don't have an answer to this. I think we'll have to wait for the regulators to explain and to give some guidance on this, but I think it's worth mentioning and just keeping this in, in mind because it's not entirely clear um, how this provision, in what context specifically it will apply. Okay, and then we come to another interesting one, the remote biometric identification systems. Now, this is a rather complicated area of the AI Act. So I've tried here to break it down and to make it as simple as possible. I think to start off with, there are two distinctions that need to be made. The first distinction is a distinction between two regimes. So remote biometric identification systems can either fall into a prohibited category or into an authorized but high risk category. That's the first distinction. The second distinction is a terminology distinction between biometric identification and biometric verification, which I will come back to in a minute. But looking first at the two regimes. So if you look first at what is prohibited, the use of um, Remote biometric identification systems applied to individuals, of course, at a distance without any active involvement of those individuals by comparing their biometric data with the biometric data that is already contained in a reference database. And if you are doing this in real time, which means that there is an instant identification of the individual in a publicly accessible space, and if it is used by, for law enforcement purposes, in, if all of these conditions are met, then that use of the remote biometric identification system will be prohibited. But then if you look on the other side at the authorized but high risk, you have the three same uh, criteria, the remote identification, uh, the, the, the lack of any active involvement of individuals and the comparison of their biometric data with biometric data in a, in a database. But if you are doing this in a purely private context, so not in, in a publicly accessible space, and for the purpose of um, verification, then it is uh, authorized, but it will be high risk. So 
what that means effectively is that uh, it will really depend on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, we Obviously, we are thinking here about facial recognition technology because that's basically what we are talking about. But depending on the context and how that facial recognition is going to be used, it can either be prohibited or high risk. Now, I mentioned that there is another distinction that needs to be made between identification and verification. And here I have to say that the, uh, the distinction is quite subtle. But when we talk about biometric verification, we are not talking about what I just explained on the previous slide. We are talking about biometrics that is used for purely authentication purposes to verify an individual's identity for the sole purpose, for example, of giving access to a service or unlocking a device. Think about the, the biometric system that unlocks uh, your, your mobile device or to give access to the individual to um, restricted areas and premises at the workplace. In that case, that does not constitute a biometric identification. It is considered as biometric verification and will not be considered as high risk. And if you look into some of the recitals of the AI Act, they give some specific examples where they, uh, these recitals mention the company and factory premises as well as office and workplace premises, sorry, workplaces that are intended to be accessed by the employees or service providers and are places that are generally not accessible to the public and are therefore excluded from the definition of real-time biometric identification in public spaces. So we see here how the legislator um, tried to at the same time circumvent and restrict the use of um, biometric uh, um, uh, uh, technology and, and facial recognition in particular in certain areas and, and very specific contexts, but at the same time um, scope out uh, 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 an area as an exception where uh, it is used purely for verification uh, purposes uh, at the workplace. And so this is interesting. Effectively what it means is that uh, companies will uh, be uh, allowed to continue to install um, uh, you know, either facial recognition or other forms of biometric uh, systems on their premises. Um, and we can think of, of, for example, nuclear plants or, you know, areas that are quite sensitive um, and, and where only um, certain employees on the, uh, you know, with, with um, authorized access will be able to enter. Right. So having looked at the, the high risk uh, AI systems, uh, that are used in, in the uh, employment uh, HR context, it's worth mentioning that um, there are some exceptions that apply. Now, these are the, the general exemptions that apply to all types of high-risk AI systems that are mentioned in the AI, AI Act. So not only those that apply in the HR context, but it's, it's uh, worth mentioning them again. Um, and essentially what the AI Act says is that in, for certain types of AI systems, they will not be considered as high risk if, for example, the AI system is used uh, strictly to perform a narrow uh, procedural task. Uh, for example, you know, cross-referencing some financial transactions against accounting records in order to verify the, the accuracy, or to improve uh, the, the result that, uh, of, of um, an action that has previously been taken by, by uh, an individual, so through some actual human activity, or it could be also to detect uh, decision-making patterns or, or deviations. Um, so for example, AI, an AI system that analyzes a user's transaction data to detect some patterns in spending uh, behavior, now, the, or, or to detect some, some frauds. There are many other examples that we can provide uh, here where, where uh, such AI may be used. And, and lastly, AI um, that is used uh, purely to perform a preparatory task to an assessment um, where um, you know, the, that assessment is, uh, falls under one of the use cases that is listed in Annex 3 of the AI Act. So you have a few areas that are uh, limited and, and listed um, uh, in, in under the, the AI Act. Um, if you fall under one of these exceptions, then it will not be considered as, as high risk. That being said, as you can see, they are quite restricted and quite limited. And essentially, it does come down to determining whether uh, the AI technology is used 
without any human intervention or if at some point there is some form of human intervention. And so uh, to the extent that the AI is acting alone or that as an organization you rely on exclusively on the AI technology without any form of human intervention or review process, then the, the, the chances are that you will not be able to rely on one of these exceptions. There is another uh, exception, which is in a way the exception to the exception, if you understand what I mean, which is that regardless of whether you fall under one of these four categories, so a narrow procedural task, improving the result, detecting decision-making patterns or a preparatory task, if at any point you are profiling the individuals, then automatically uh, the high risk applies to your AI system again. So what this means is that there is going to necessarily organizations are going to have to carry out quite a lot of uh, risk assessment uh, because the devil is really in the detail and what will matter is the specific context and the manner in which the AI technology is used and deployed and how it is used and to what extent uh, there is a human intervention in the process. All of this is going to have to be assessed um, and, and determined uh, in, in advance uh, in order to, to, to know effectively if um, uh, such use of, of the AI technology is high risk or not. So that closes the, this section on uh, high risk and now I will pass it back over to Katarina who will talk to you about the use of generative AI in the workplace. Thank you Olivier. Now generative AI in the workplace is, is I don't want to say common yet, but more and more common. Almost every company, us included, is already using some form of AI, and most of it is, of course, a generative AI. Um, and that is why we want to look at some of the details here. Um, we're looking at the next slide, please, where we have differentiated the general types of Gen AI that companies are using and developing in in their in their field now you're all aware that there's lots of off the shelf off the shelf software already that can be made available to the workforce one of the most most widely distributed is of course chat gpt or the competitor copilot they're being used a lot um, things like ai companion but also um, deepl is the translation service what we're also seeing more and more being used, um, and, and that's not necessarily Gen AI, but it's, um, it's analytical AI is in conferencing tools where this is being used. And the generative part is again, that the conferencing tools automatically create protocols such as Zoom AI or also in Teams, um, this functionality is being presented and it's already widely being used. What these systems, gen ai systems and tools have in common is they're off the shelf they're not necessarily tailored to the company who's using them um, and they're often also widely used in the workplace they can be used for lots of different functionalities and um, they render lots of the tasks lots of everyday tasks that we're doing um, a lot more efficient and help the workforce in producing their, their job results easier and more efficiently. What's often even better at this is the tools on the right-hand side, this, the very specific Gen AI tools um, to specific tasks that we're looking at. Some, some of these are provided by external providers according to specifications of the company, or sometimes if the company requires a very specific one and has a distinct need, they will might even develop it themselves, also depending on their internal capacities and competencies that they have. Ones that we do already see quite a bit of um, as examples here are um, customer relationship tool integrations. There, there, there's lots of overlap and sales assistance. We already talked about chatbots in the in the finance industry before when we were talking about the prohibited practices. Of course, this doesn't always have to be a prohibited practice. Chatbots are 
widely used. I've used them a lot um, and I find um, very often they're more efficient than trying to get on the line with a telephonic support hotline. So do feel free to make use of them when you encounter them. It's often a not so frustrating experience. There is also AI generated promotional content that um, of course the companies try to or with which the companies try to target their audience better and then there's custom and employee assistance so they can be used on on, on both sides you try to uh, assist your customers or you can even use kind of a chatbot or an assistant internally where you help your workforce navigate for instance your IT system or answer other questions that come up here in the in the workforce area. These are the various Gen AI tools that we can look at. There are some requirements for certain AI systems, which we're presenting on the next slide. In particular, that and we, we want to highlight this for you because these are very important and and basically applicable to all the AI systems is transparency requirements. This is one of the um, one of the big lines that we always see with almost everything within the AI Act. Transparency is one of the main motives of lots of the provisions in the AI Act. And we also see in interacting with the clients when they interact with their customers with their employees, the transparency is valued by the recipient or on the other side. These are, we've given you here four examples for transparency requirements for specific AI systems. Um, I've just mentioned the chatbots as an example. That is an AI system that interacts directly with people. And if this is of course, AI, if I have an AI chatbot on the other side, providers must inform the individuals that they're interacting with a machine. So you don't have John Doe on the other side, but you have the computer that is talking to you. Um, and you will probably eventually find out what you find preferable when you interact with these chatbots. Another transparency requirement is with generative AI, providers must ensure that it's, it's similar to, to the chatbot, providers must ensure that the output that you, that you generate, whether it's audio, image, video, text, what have you, that has to be marked as artificially generated or manipulated. I'm pretty sure that isn't always the case, looking at some of the LinkedIn contributions that one sees or other articles um, where I'm not always sure whether the authors always indicate so correctly, um, but it has to be borne in mind that you should be doing that. Another one that is again important in the, in the workspace is the transparency requirements in the emotion recognition systems. The deployers here must inform the exposed individuals of the operation of the system. If you're using emotion recognition systems, you must inform the individuals and certainly in advance. And don't forget, you also have to process personal data in compliance with GDPR. Now we're always talking about the AI Act, but never forget that there is also lots of other regulations that you need to comply with anyway, or in addition to the AI Act, you can't just check off the box of the AI Act. For deep fakes, Deployers must disclose that content has been artificially generated or manipulated. I understand that sometimes defeats the purpose of deepfakes, but at least the law tries to rectify that. Next slide, please. Now, switching back briefly to the high-risk AI systems um, on which Olivier explained quite a bit. There are obligations for providers and obligations for deployers. Let's quickly sit with the obligations for the providers. Um, those are detailed in Article 8 and following. The systems that they provide shall comply with the requirements in the AI Act following Article 8. Now, of course, a risk management system that has to accompany the AI system um, 
I would like to talk, spend just a minute on the next bullet point, data and data governance, because this is so, so, so important also with regard to the quality of the AI system, because in particular, this, this deals with data and data governance in Article 10. And in particular, if, if this is also used for training the AI, this is a paragraph that requires that the data sets must meet certain quality criteria which are set out in Article 10. Um, and the, the training, validation and testing data sets are, must be subject to data governance and certain management practices, design choices, data collection processes regarding the origin of the data. All of this serves to, to basically ensure in Article 10, number three, that the data sets are relevant, representative, free of errors, and complete. This is one of the most important paragraphs, in my view, when you're looking at generally the quality of your AI system. You also have to ensure that the um, that the data sets, the testing data sets, are, are um, have the appropriate statistical properties regarding the persons or groups of persons in relation to whom the high risk AI system is intended to be used. And number five deals with bias detection and correction, which is a major, major issue in, in the use of AI systems. So please, please, please look at the quality of the data sets and how you can ensure that. In addition, technical documentation, you have to have your TOMS up to date, you need to do record keeping. Um, another one that is quite important is transparency and provision of information to deployers. When I look at this in Article 13 of the AI Act, it kind of sounds like you have to provide instructions for users that are similar to an IKEA manual. Um, the information must be concise, complete, correct and clear. Now, I know that the IKEA manuals aren't always like that, but we would at least like your AI instructions for use to be like that. We also come to human oversight, accuracy, robustness and cybersecurity. You must have a quality management system that of course then ties back into the previous points and allows you to verify all these previous points and ensure that um, documentation keeping and of course automatically generated logs and then the registration in the EU database. That will come on top of it as the cherry. On the next slide, we also present you with some of the obligations for the deployers. They are similar, but not identical. Again, you have to update your TOMS. You already have all your TOMS for, for GDPR purposes. Now you have to include the AI measures. Um, in accordance with the instructions for use, you remember your IKEA manual for the high-risk AI system. Um, the human oversight obligation also applies to the deployers. Of course, it's even more important at the deployers that human oversight for the decision-making by the AI system is there. The input data must be relevant and sufficiently representative. Here we're trying again to ensure that the outcome is of good quality, is without bias, and can be used for the purpose. The operation must be monitored. You have to check on whether it continues to perform um, in the way that you intended it to perform. Now, also for the, um, for the provider to be able to do some quality management, you have to report your serious incidents back to the provider or the importer or distributor, and of course, to your regulator once they are appointed. Logs have to be kept, and here is now a very specific delectable, especially for companies, uh, for countries such as Germany and France, where you have a workers' council. Please, please, please involve your workers' council or other representative body before you put into service a high-risk AI system. You're, they, they sometimes have co-determination rights. They at least need to be informed. If you don't inform them and they find out afterwards, that is not going to go down well. Individuals also need to be informed. We had that regarding the transparency requirements two slides ago. When, if and when you subject them to high-risk AI systems, you need to inform them, of course. A DPIA may be required. Remember your GDPR obligations. 
And of course, we want you to cooperate with your authorities. That always is a good thing. Next slide, please. And I think I'm handing back over to you, Olivier. Thank you. Thank you, Katerina. And so indeed, uh, we are reaching the, uh, the, the last part of this uh, webinar. We're going to focus a little bit on the risks and, and enforcement. Um, just a quick note to our audience to let you know that if you do want to ask a question, uh, you can do so. You can type in your question in the questions box. So please start thinking about uh, any questions you may have. Um, we will have a few minutes uh, before the end of this session to, to take them. So if we sort of summarize um, what we have seen until now, and uh, this is a very sort of simple way of presenting the, the risk level of AI systems versus the probability. Okay, so if you look at the prohibited AI practices, the risk, the level of risk is going to be very high because as you will see in, in the next slide, uh, the highest fines under the AI Act will apply to the prohibited AI practices. That being said, if you have done your job well and you have assessed and made sure that your organization is not doing anything that is prohibited, then the probability of that risk materializing is going to be rather low. For high-risk AI systems, particularly when they are used in the HR space, the risk level is also high because the fines and sanctions are quite high for high-risk AI systems, particularly if you're deploying them without complying with all of the obligations that Katahina has just explained, which apply to high-risk AI systems. So there, the probability could also be quite high. And then lastly, for generative AI, such as the, the chatbots or, or tools that uh, help you in, in your work, uh, the risk level is going to be relatively low, um, unless, of course, the, the generative AI is used in a high-risk uh, scenario. So you always need to be careful whether uh, the AI system falls under that high-risk category or not. But assuming that's not the case, then the risk is going to be relatively low. You really need just to make sure that you're complying with that transparency obligation. Um, but the probability um, of, of uh, that risk materializing can actually be quite high. Why? Because uh, the use of generative AI is much more uh, widespread and, and, um, and obviously you have your uh, potentially your entire workforce now that is uh, using or going to use uh, generative AI tools. So you want to make sure that um, everyone within the organization is aware uh, of the do's and don'ts whenever they are using Gen AI. Um, the fines, well, I think uh, most of us are probably already familiar with them. You have three categories of fines. So, as I mentioned, if you place on the EU market a prohibited AI system, then you risk a fine of 35 million euro or 7% of your company's annual uh, global, that is worldwide turnover. Um, if uh, you are in breach of your obligations for any high-risk AI systems, and this also applies to the general purpose AI uh, models that we, we didn't talk about in this session, then uh, you're facing a 50 million euro fine or 3% of annual worldwide turnover. Uh, these uh, fines and sanctions can apply uh, to all of the different actors in, in the, uh, the AI ecosystem, so the providers, importers, distributors, and deployers, which means that the in, enforcement bodies can go after any of these uh, organizations and they all have their respective obligations uh, you know, with regards to, to high-risk uh, AI systems. So they all have a, um, a part to play in making sure that high-risk AI systems are used in accordance with the law. And then finally, 7.5 million or 1% of uh, uh, annual turnover if you are uh, totally ignoring or, or not complying with uh, the requests um, uh, and inquiries coming from the regulators. Now, we did do a little bit of... Uh, uh, check in with uh, Katarina on the position of the, the, the regulators. Now, we, we focused on the data protection authorities, obviously, because the, the AI regulators are not yet in place. Um, we only focused on three countries, France, Germany, and the UK. What we have found is that, rough, uh, broadly speaking, um, most of the regulators have, at least these three, have already issued uh, some guidelines uh, on AI, but they tend to be, at this point, still general uh, guidelines and focusing a lot on the interplay between the AI Act and the GDPR. So, for example, uh, the, the, the CNIL gives a few examples uh, of AI that is used in the workplace, but is not focusing uh, specifically and, and has not necessarily 
um, looked at all of the, the use cases where AI may be used in the workplace. So a lot of the recommendations of these regulators are going to be um, fairly high level, such as you know making sure that there is some human uh, oversight, um, informing the employees, going back to what uh, Katarina was saying, um, and making sure that the AI is explained to uh, employees and, and avoiding uh, bias. Um, in the UK, uh, the ICO also made some, some rather practical recommendations, making sure that uh, companies are uh, carrying out a DPIA whenever the use of AI constitutes a risk for individuals, once again, informing them about AI, particularly when the AI is used to make decisions that have an impact on the individuals, and things uh, such as uh, you know um, implementing the data minimization principle or techniques in order to, to mitigate and reduce risk. Um, Katarina, do you want to say a quick word on the regulators in Germany? If not, you can see on the slide that uh, in in Germany. Uh, uh, sorry, I was sorry, I was muted. Go again. ahead. <laughs> in in Germany, um, as you can see on the slide, of course, the the DSK, which is the Datenschutz Conference, um, and a kind of a, a joint um, discussion panel of the authorities, they issued an orientation on AI and and data protection in general, and also the the combination of these two. And there are some points on AI in in the workplace, and I've I've alluded to some of them before. And so it, it, they kind of stress that you need to involve your DPO and of course the Works Council. Um, they've also recommend that if you want your employees to use AI, you should be providing company account, accounts and devices for that, so that they don't have to use the personal devices, for instance, their mobile phones for using the AI. And then one of the important points that, I don't, that not only the DSK stressed, but also the Bavarian Data Protection Authority, is that you need to train employees on if, when, and how to use AI. That is one of the key focus points that all authorities like to see. Sorry, Olivier, thank you. Yes, uh, so just wrapping up um, with a, a, a few um, tips and, and recommendations on some steps and actions that you can take. And, and I think at least, you know, from what we are seeing at Field Fisher, uh, many organizations are doing this already. So I think, you know, a basic thing, uh, which is fairly straightforward, uh, is, is starting to map your AI systems. Um, when I say straightforward, I, I mean it in, in, in terms of something that you need to do. It's maybe not as easy as, as it may sound. Uh, particularly in large organizations where there's so much AI that, that is now being used. But I think it is going to be uh, necessary, at least as a first step, to, to, to understand uh, what types of AI your organization is using or wants to acquire and start making those risk assessments. The second thing is, is what Katarina uh, highlighted, the AI governance process. Now, the term governance can have a different meaning in different organizations, but I think um, at a high level, you should be thinking at least uh, to, to have a, a sort of AI task force or, or uh, some key stakeholders who are um, um, properly trained on, on AI and who are capable of uh, making recommendations uh, to, to the management in order to, to mitigate uh, the risk and then start thinking about putting in place uh, some policies. Um, the AI literacy, um, Katarina also mentioned this, but upskilling your workforce, training, um, or, or just raising awareness so through various campaigns. This is also something that is very useful. And then sort of linked to that, start thinking about uh, drafting and deploying guidelines or rules or policies for your workforce, especially with respect to the use of Gen AI. Like always with new technology, it's very exciting at the beginning, but especially if you're relying on the free versions of, um, of the, the Gen AI that is available on, on the market, that's where there are risks, and so at minimum, you need to provide uh, some guidance to your workforce on how to use these tools in what context and the things they should avoid doing. And then uh, we don't have time to develop this, but this is an important area, is start reviewing the terms of the contracts with your AI vendors, whether it's um, the HR department or the procurement uh, department who is negotiating um, the acquisition uh, or, or um, licensing terms for various products 
and, and AI tools that are going to be deployed or made available to your workforce, you absolutely need to start looking at the, the terms and, and negotiating them. And uh, that's where the determination of your role as either a provider or a deployer of that AI is absolutely going to be key. So with that, um, we still have a few minutes left to take some, some questions. And I don't know, Katarina, if you've had a chance to look in the question box. Um, I, I did yes. have a look. There are some questions. Let me pick out one um, that came up asking um, a DPIA when required, same as the GDPR requirements or enhanced. The GDPR basically says that when you're using new technology, which is likely to result in a high risk to the rights and freedoms of natural persons. So that implies that almost every high risk AI system will require a DPIA. It will be difficult to argue for a high risk GP, uh, AI system to get out of this. For the other AI systems, you will have to go back to GDPR and determine, is it likely to result in a high risk, even though it's not a high risk AI system, and then to determine under GDPR requirements. There is another question that maybe Olivier, you would be happy to answer, and that is, do you have any other examples of biometric identification versus verification? Yeah, uh, that, that's a that's a good question. So I I did think about you know um, what can be an example of biometric uh, identification in in the workplace. Um, uh, as a reminder, um, uh, you know when you um, uh, analyze this this legal concept in opposition with verification, we're not talking about uh, authentic uh, authenticating individuals or verifying their identity, but um, comparing uh, the biometric data of, of uh, employees compared to biometric data that is already stored in a database. Now, uh, I have to say that uh, the I would expect that you know most of those uh, use cases will will probably not apply so much in in the workplace. But you can imagine, for example, that um, some companies may may want to uh, to maintain to have a, a biometric uh, system uh, database and. Um, if they have some some um, facial recognition cameras that are active on on the premises, uh, they may want to then uh, uh, use that biometric system in order to identify um, individuals who, for example, have committed uh, a crime or a felony on the work uh, premises, and they are not doing this in real time because that would fall under the prohibited practice. So if they are doing it post factum, for example, um, as part of an investigation and they want to um, find the identity of uh, an individual who has committed a wrongdoing on the premises um, and in that case uh, the, the company would uh, uh, would try and identify that individual through the biometric data by comparing uh, for example um, the CCTV footage and images with the bi biometric data in a system. Maybe it sounds a little bit too far-fetched, a bit too much a big brother, if you ask me. Uh, and hopefully companies are not really doing this, but I don't think we can exclude it um, altogether. So that would be one example that uh, I could give um, to answer this question. Thank you, Olivier. There's, I think we have two more minutes for another question. And this one is with regard to the training for employees. Is there any guidance on whether this should be all employees or just those using the AI? In, in my view, it should be those using AI or those likely to use AI in the future. The, oftentimes, AI is not only rolled out to certain individuals, especially when we're talking about Gen AI, such as Copilot or, or ChatGPT. And then, of course, you want to train all employees. It certainly doesn't hurt. There, I, I don't have specific guidance on this from the regulators, but it certainly doesn't hurt to train them because they might be doing it on their own without you even knowing it. That's always a risk because employees do these things, as you probably know. Hmm. Um, um, Katarina, there's maybe very briefly one last question that I did want to answer. In a corporate yes, setting, is a company, if sorry, if a company makes a third-party high-risk AI system available to its affiliates, does it become a provider of a high-risk system? 
Really, really good question. Now, with some of my associates, we are right in the middle of um, assessing those kinds of, of scenarios. I, what I can say is that it, it's, not, it's not easy because it's not always straightforward. Um, the fact that you are making available a third-party high-risk AI system, so I understand this as a high-risk system that has been developed by a third party, um, um, you know, does not necessarily um, or automatically put you in, in the category as a, a deployer. Um, it, it really depends on, on whether you are instructing that third party to develop an, uh, an AI tool or system on your behalf, or if you are requiring something, acquiring something, for example, off the shelf. Um, the fact that you are then making it available to your affiliates, I, I'm not 100% certain that this is really the determining factor uh, in order to, de to, to, to decide whether you're acting as a provider or, or a deployer. Um, it's, it's rather, um, I mean, I guess the, the, the question comes rather from the, the making available, uh, and, and uh, those are the terms under the AI Act. Um, but, but I think you, you, you need, to me, what, what is probably important here is, is trying to assess at the start, um, you know, who, who is the developer of the AI because the provider is really um, initially the one who has developed that AI. But um, not, not an easy um, question to answer, I have to say, because of the, 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 the different scenarios that are possible. And so I think it, it will really depend on, on a case by case basis. Um, so I think we've reached the hour. So on this slide, you, you'll have seen that um, if you want to, to access more information, more detailed information, you can find it on our website. We have plenty of resource, resources there that are accessible to, to everyone. And um, yes, this uh, webinar has been recorded, so it will be made available on our YouTube channel, uh, similar to all of the other recordings of um, the entire uh, AI webinar series that we have run throughout 2024. So with that, we are one minute past uh, the hour. So I would like, first of all, to thank Katarina for co-presenting uh, this webinar with me. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. And thank you, Olivier. And uh, with that, uh, thank you very much to our audience. And we look forward to having you again on our next uh, webinar. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.